Welcome to the 385 horsepower supercharged 85 Fiero Closer Look Part 2. Hopefully you've already seen Part 1 on my channel as well as the other Fiero videos. Let's get started with Part 2 right now. Enough of that screwing around. Okay guys, here are the stock Fiero benchmarks that we set out to beat. The horsepower and torque, you can see we've more than doubled. Zero to 60 time, we've more than halved. Uh, quarter mile time, we shaved about four seconds off of. Fuel economy, keep in mind that's 85, so 20 versus 25. Curb weight's a little bit more. Uh, the main differences are we've added a little for the weight of the 3800, but we've shaved off weight by taking out the entire air conditioning system. And braking from 60 to zero is not very good. 150 feet stock, but 160 feet uh, with the upgrade due to the extra 100 pounds or so. Okay guys, let's get back into the nuts and bolts of the 3800 Fiero swap. Again, if you missed part one of the Fiero 3800, closer look. I'll put a link in your upper left hand corner and the description below. It talks about the modifications that have been done to this engine from stock. But for this video, let's talk about, um, this came out of a 97 Buick Regal GS. You can also use a Grand Prix and uh, there's plenty of other GM vehicles with this supercharged 3800. So you need the engine, you need the computer, which is in this housing here, um, the wiring harness, which you will modify quite a bit, and the transmission if you're gonna use the automatic, which I highly suggest because it's extremely durable uh, for, from the donor car. You need to have um, a good wiring diagram for the donor vehicle that the 3800 is coming out of. And you also need the wiring diagram out of the Fiero. But when I did this swap, it was my first one. I'm not what you would call a master electrical fuel injected technician, but I, I knew enough to know when I was pulling the engine, what I would do is I would identify the wires per the manual in the wiring diagram that I knew that I wasn't going to need in the Fiero, you know, such as there's some wiring that goes to the power steering for some feedback. There's some wiring that goes to the air conditioning, which I wasn't going to use. Wiring that goes to some sensors in the fuel tank for OBD2 uh, that the Fiero doesn't have. So what I would do is try to thin that harness, because it is quite thick in the donor vehicle. Um, start removing wires, you know, two or three at a time, that I was confident that I knew I didn't need. I'd cut them and pull them out of the way. Then I would start the vehicle back up and make sure it ran and ran well and check for codes, make sure there weren't any codes that I wasn't expecting. Like for example, when you remove the air conditioning wires, you start it up, you're probably gonna get some AC related codes and that's fine because I'm not gonna use AC in this vehicle. So it takes a little bit of work, but if you're meticulous, if you utilize Penox Fiero Forum and the internet, you can find all the information you need to do the electrical part of the swap. And I'll show you what's inside here with the PCM. PCM, of course, stands for Powertrain Control Module. So here's all the wiring that is specifically, you know, described in this wiring diagram. And, you know, this is what needs to be retained for the uh, functions of the fuel injection that you need to retain on the 3800 as it's in the Fiero. This is the under, under hood compartment fuse box from the donor vehicle. I've removed all the stuff that are, are not needed for this application, and some of these are actually still extra. Um, this is from the 97 donor vehicle. I guess the 98s and newers are much smaller, and a lot of people will put them inside the Fiero in, in place of the stock Fiero computer, and that, of course, gets removed. Um, but again, you need to carefully retain the wires you need to make this engine run properly with this computer, and you also need to be able to figure out which ones to interface. If you've got pretty serious mechanical skills and a good working knowledge of electrical and that sort of thing. It's definitely doable. It, you'll have to rely on the internet a lot to achieve that. So that's the spiel on the electrical part. Let me take a moment to address a couple questions I had on the part one video. Uh, number one, why is there a breather on here? And the reason is with running close to 14 pounds of boost, I've got to believe there's more cylinder blow by than there would be stock and it's just a precautionary measure to make sure that the blow-by doesn't force oil up the seals instead any extra blow-by that the pcv system cannot handle just gets vented through the uh, crankcase breather here on the valve cover second question has to do with the egr valve and this one is a very controversial subject 
The reason I've kept the EGR valve is because I've got some research that shows from a GM engineer that this actually does increase your fuel mileage at cruise, and it makes sense. What it does, it's computer controlled, thus the wire. It's not like the old ones back in the 70s that were garbage and they've clogged all the time and the vacuum lines it was all messed up. What it does is it injects inert exhaust gas back into the intake system at cruise. And what that does, it's kind of like, the way I look at it is a, a displacement on demand. This is a 3.8 V6. And when you're just cruising in a lightweight car like this, it doesn't need that much horsepower at all to cruise down the road, but it does need to stay burning at 14.7 to 1. That's what they're programmed to burn at on lean cruise. So what this does by injecting that inert air into the cylinder, it makes the cylinder smaller essentially because part of it is filled up with just inert burnt gases and then the rest of that needs to be 14.7 to 1. So it uh, results in more fuel economy. Now the downside to the EGR valve is this carbon buildup inside the intake track on the rotors and um, this has got 160,000 miles on it. It has not been a problem. It's not pretty to look at, but there is a little coating. Now if you had an intercooler on here, um, the intercooler that goes underneath the supercharger, and I do not have an intercooler by the way to make that clear, if those fins are getting coated with carbon buildup, that could add restriction to your intercooler and also coat it and insulate it so it doesn't transfer heat as well. So for intercooled applications, I would probably get rid of this. Um, but for my application, yeah, it's not pretty to look at, but it increases the fuel economy marginally, and I don't have any downsides to it, so I've uh, opted to keep it. The third question and a lot of controversy is, why would you put a uh, 4T65 EHD transmission in kind of a sports car? Uh, it's gotta have a manual transmission. And that one is just kind of a, a personal preference thing. I do have a C5 here with a supercharger on it as well. It's a six-speed manual. I love, I love that setup as well. This is totally different. I do more drag racing with this, quite frankly, because you know both cars are 11-second cars. But this one's more fun because it, it really kind of irritates a lot of people when they get beat by a very low-budget Fiero. And the automatic transmission is much better for that application, in my opinion. The time that it takes the computer to shift through the gears versus me with the manual, it's going to be a little bit less with the automatic. Plus, the launch is much better with the multiplication of torque from the torque converter that automatics enjoy on the starting line and the ability to hold the brake and you know kick up the RPM a little bit to get that good launch. So for this purpose, the automatic is better. At the end of the day, if I had to choose one between an automatic and a manual, boy, I probably would go with an automatic because it's just painful being in any kind of traffic with a manual transmission, especially rush hour traffic. But they both have their uh, pros and cons and you know, teach their own. Hey guys, that's a wrap on Furo 3800 Supercharged Part 2. Be on the lookout for Part 3 in the next week to 10 days. Please hit that like and subscribe button below. And as always, thanks for watching. Uh.